All right, guys, and welcome back. Right, today's episode, I want to be taking this 1.2 engine out of this Vauxhall Nova, ready for this mighty C20 XE. Right, so as you can see, I've already drained the coolant. Next job, I'm just going to start removing some of this stuff that's in the way. I removed the hoses from the coolant header tank, followed by the retaining screw holding it to the chassis. The coil is then removed. This is held on with two 10 millimeter acne screws. The plug and clips and the HT lead just pulls off. The screen wash bottle just pulls out the slot and the screen wash pump just unplugs. Really easy stuff. I then unbolt the two Phillips screws holding on the air box, lift it up and pull out the breather and vacuum parts. I unclip the throttle cable. This has a little retaining clip which can be a little bit fiddly. And then remove the cable from the mount on top of the manifold. The servo hose unscrews from the inlet with a 17mm spanner and just pulls out the servo. I then unclip the ROM plug from the bulkhead and the pipe from the map sensor. There are various plugs around the inlet that need unclipping. Things like the injector, coolant temperature sensor, idle control valve. This is all straightforward stuff though. I then remove the fuel feed and return from the throttle body and the earth for the fuel injection system. So this being a late model single point injection, it does have an ECU, it does have a primitive loom, but it's still a loom. Now, where the C20XEs and some of the later engines differ is that they are removable, the looms, so you can normally unplug them somewhere and isolate it from the rest of the vehicle. On these 1.2 Novas, it is the whole engine and body loom is one. You can't disconnect it. So I'm going to have to disconnect all the plugs to the engine out. Um, but there is some positives to that. For example, the fuel pump wire in here, which would go here, I could utilize this for the um, standalone injection system. So if I feed the red wire with the blue trace, trace, it makes fuel come out. I hope you can see that. So that's perfect. So I can use some of this wiring. I can use some of the plugs. I can use a few bits and bobs. Um, but I'm just going to have to trim it back, basically. Decide what I want, what I don't want. But yeah, that should make it a little bit easier for me because I don't have to run this. Now, stuff like the Dizzy doesn't need to come off. However, I'm going to take it off. Just gives it a little bit more room. Now, obviously, this engine bay is absolutely immaculate. The car's had a full bare shell restoration. And the engine bay is being painted to a very high standard. So I really don't want to risk scratching it. The Dizzy is held on with an M8 nut and a clamp and just simply slides out the cam. The HT leads just pull off. I then use a flat screwdriver to push back the tabs on the grill to allow me to remove it. There are four across the top and one under each headline. I'm really careful doing this as a brake really easily. Beautiful. It is in perfect condition, just a little bit dirty. Right, headlights out now. I'm only doing this because they are basically brand new and I don't want to break them. Couple of plugs on the back. Couple of acne screws. There's a spring on the back of the indicator. Just hooked on. That pulls out like that. That's the spring. And then finally, the headlight pulls out. There's a clip here. If you just pull it forward, it should come out. As you can see, that's a brand new headlight. And then move on to the radiator and hoses. The rad is secured with two metal spring clips that just squeeze together to release. With these removed, I can pull the rad back to allow better access to the hoses. While I'm in there, I unplug the reverse switch from the gearbox, the fan plug, and pull off the horn wires. The rad fan is unbolted. This is held on with two M6 bolts and just slides out. Then the rad and hose assembly can be lifted out, and I remove the hose that connects the engine to the header tank, and that's the front of the engine stripped. Right, so the next job, guys, is to remove the bonnet. And as you can see, I've done a bit of masking. It just to protect things, because I'm doing this by myself. So put loads of tape around things just to stop me from scratching the paint basically. Paint's in perfect condition and we don't want to ruin it. So let's set the bonnet off. So what I tend to do is just wedge my shoulder underneath it, support the bottom with my hand. I, I drop that side on the scuttle panel, this side's still on the prop. Remove the bolts, carefully drop it down onto the scuttle which is protected, take the prop out, and 
and then that's it. I'm going to put it down some cardboard. Now look at that, hasn't that let the dog see the rabbit? Right, so next job we need to jack the car up, take the wheels off, take the drive shafts out, hubs, etc. And we can start dropping the engine out. I just made this very, very crude little pad. It's a foam pad with a bit of wood just to go under the chassis leg because it's in such good condition I don't want to scratch it. As you can see, these wheels are absolutely mint. So again, don't want to mark them. So I'm using a plastic tool just to pop the caps off. So these are aluminium caps and they are known for being a bit tight. There you go. Not too bad, actually. Ah, these are actually slightly different to the last ones. The last that I had, these were solid. This is like a steel plate riveted on, essentially. But yeah, got them off. Look at them. They're absolutely perfect. A little bit dirty, but amazing. However, I don't like that. They are stretched. <laughs> Not a big fan of that. I um, think that needs to be sorted out personally. Right, I've just undone the dry shaft nut. So the dry shaft's now free, taking the brake off. So now I'm going to start taking the suspension apart. I unbolt the shock from the hub. This is held on with two M12 bolts. A 19mm socket on the impact gun makes light work of them. The bottom pinch bolt is already out, so it's just a case of knocking the lower ball joint out with a hammer. And there we go, one hub ready to go to Harry Hockley and be machined out so we can put two little hubs inside this. The tie rod bracket bolts to the cross member with three M10 bolts. One small captive one and two larger bolts with nuts. Once off, I get the caliper out of the way by clipping it to the shock absorber. One quick tug and the shaft pulls out of the gearbox. Just be mindful that it will leak fluid to have some time to catch it. One charcoal canister. Now this is fitted to latent overs with injection um, and is basically does sink with the fuel vapour. don't exactly know what, but I think it puts fuel vapour from the fuel tank back into the intake system, but we're not going to be requiring any of this. So that's going. One bracket removed and a little bit more weight saving. Right now, I need to repeat the process on this side. So this cap is proven to be a little bit more difficult, like the speed lines I know. So I might have to use a screwdriver and put a little bit of tape around it. Well, hey, got it. I unbolt the wheel, remove the circlet from the dry shaft and unbolt the 30 millimeter nut holding it in place. The track red end nut is removed using the 17 millimeter socket and an impact driver. I shot the ball joint out by hitting the side of the carrier with a mallet. Being a tapered ball joint, this trick works normally really well. I can now turn the steering and remove the retaining screw from the disc and the two 10 millimeter Allen bolts holding the caliper hanger to the carrier. The caliper can then slide off and be clipped to the shock. The 13 millimeter headed lower ball joint pinch bolt is removed and the dry shaft is once again given a tug and pulled out. I then remove the two 19mm clamp bolts for the shock and pull off the hub assembly. The tie rod is then unbolted from the cross member and taken out of the way. The battery feed to the starter is then removed. Don't worry, the battery was disconnected first, followed by the exciter wire and the engine earth and gear linkage. The engine loom is all part of the main body loom and is fed back up into the top with the rest of the loom. The battery loom is pulled out of the firewall and I took the rest of the loom in the scuttle area out of the way. I did the same with the fuel lines to avoid any snagging and unbolt the map sensor. I then undid the two 50mm bolts from the front of the downpipe and the three 30mm rear ones from behind the car. That's the exhaust out of the way. So we're now at a point where I can drop the engine down under the engine mounts, etc. So I'm going to do this slightly unconventionally. I'm going to drop it all down, unbolt the gearbox, pull it off, slide it out. And then I think I'm just going to lift the engine through the top. I think it's going to be a bit easier to do by myself. I'm using my trusty old crane, last inspected in 1978, so I don't get too close. This is attached to the engine using an eBay special load leveler I got for Christmas a few years ago. Very handy if you're taking lots of engines out. I let the crane take the weight of the engine and box, and then I start unbolting the mounts. Two knots on the driver's side, but I like to take the complete mount off to avoid scratching the cross member. Followed by one big M10 bolt on the passenger side, again I take the whole mount off. And lastly, two small M10s in the lower floor section. The engine is then carefully dropped down out of the way. I then remove the bell housing bolts from the gearbox and prize the gearbox away from the engine. 
and then jack the engine back up and pull it out over the top. Easy peasy and no damage done to the paintwork, which is the main thing. And there we go guys, the engine and the gearbox are out of this Vauxhall Nova shell. So if you haven't already, hit the subscribe button, hit the like button, and in next week's episode, we'll hopefully start putting a 2-litre engine in this body shell. Stay tuned for more, guys. Bye-bye.